Brussels, raising awareness for eating disorders by talking about her own experience. Uh, this subject has never been more urgent, with eating disorders in children increasing by 400% during lockdown. And Gemma joins us now. Hi there, Gemma. Hi. Hi, how are you? Uh, these are really shocking uh, figures, Gemma. I mean, do they surprise you? Um, no, they don't. I think lockdown has created a huge pressure cooker for us all. Um, and especially with uh, eating disorders, eating disorders are a mental health illness, which are based around food being the symptom and not the cause. Um, and I say that when I mean it's a, a mental health illness where we use it to control things that we can't externally control. And we're living in a day and age now where everything is out of our control. So I'm not surprised by the, the, the rising catastrophic number of uh, eating disorder um, issues in, in the country at the moment. I mean, your own experience began when you were as, as young as 10, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I was 10 years old and in hindsight, um, I realised it was down to the bully and I, I couldn't control what people were saying or doing to me, but I could control what went inside me. But at 10 years old, I didn't know that. I didn't even really understand what anorexia was or an eating disorder and I certainly didn't know how to articulate it. Um, and my parents took me to the doctor because they spotted the warning signs, God loved them. But the doctor turned me away um, and said I wasn't low enough in weight to have a problem. Uh, cut to a year and a half later, I was admitted to a children's adolescent psychiatric unit and told that if I didn't eat or drink within 24 hours, I'd be dead. And thus began 13 years uh, narrative of, of my life, battling and fighting for my life with an eating disorder. And Gemma, you, you, you really do want to stress the point, don't you, that we, we kind of obsess too much with the way somebody looks, how thin they actually are. It's one of the first questions. And, and you think that that's a real disservice because, in a way, it, it moves on too quickly past that. Absolutely. Um, early intervention is so key when it comes to eating disorders. Waiting for the weight to change isn't going to change what is already there. Mm. And we've got to stop trying to, to treat a mental health illness by looking at physical attributes. <coughs> um, you know, we uh, have a, a charity called Seed that was co-founded by my amazing parents through our lived experience. And the reason we, we do the work we do is because so many people come to us who aren't low enough in weight to be deemed to have a problem. Mm. Now, anorexia is, is the one that's talked about such a lot, and it's devastating. I've been there, I've done it, and I nearly died from it. But there's bulimia, there's overeating, there's binge eating, there's anorexia binge eating type, there's um, OSFED, which is um, other specified feeding or eating disorders, there's ARFID, which is avoidant restricting food intake disorder. None of these things get discussed. So therefore, waiting for the weight to change isn't going to help anybody. Mm. Bulimia and, and binge eating and all these other awful eating disorders that are mental health issues can kill. Like, I... it's got the highest mortality rate of any other mental health illness. Uh... And we need to start taking it more seriously. And Gemma, what about sort of state help? Because at the minute, they get involved really late in the process. Is that like a false economy? Should they get involved earlier? I, I've got to be very careful <laughs> where I go with this because I don't want this to be about pointing fingers and blame because that's not going to change the narrative or get us anywhere. But early intervention is not being implemented and it's not being seen as a priority. Now, I know that 500 million has been pumped into the NHS and mental health services for next year, but in my honest opinion, next year is too late. I've been going through this since I was 10 years old and I'm well and recovered now. But I'm 37 this year and still we are dealing with the same issues again and again where people can't get the treatment that they need early on. And it's, it's wrong and it's costing people their lives. Gemma, I'm really grateful that you're being so brave and speaking so beautifully on such a difficult subject, even for you personally. Can I ask you, you talk a lot about early intervention. For any parents out there that are watching today, what should they be looking for? What are those signs? What differentiates it from just being a phase that, that their teenager may be going through or a young person may be going through and a serious mental illness that, 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 that is an eating disorder? Can you give advice? What, what, what advice would you give a parent? It's, it's so difficult, Kelly, because um, a lot of it is to do with, with, uh, with a mental health illness. It's, it's very silent and, and an eating disorder is very clever and a very manipulative enemy 
to somebody and they will be secretive, they will make the person be secretive, they will control things that normally the person wouldn't do and it's, yeah. it's very hard. The, it's not always about the physical, it's not always about the weight loss, it's about the demeanour of a person. If you know that person and their personality and they've gone from being bub bubbly and outgoing, a bit like I was as a child, to being more introvert, to not wanting to join in um, activities, to not wanting to go to school, to being avoidant of mealtimes, to saying they've eaten out in different places when actually they haven't. And it's also very difficult as well with the world that we've been living in in lockdown because those, those secretive habits are now right under the telescope. So I think it's really important to reach out when you see behaviours in that person's characteristics changing because one thing an eating disorder loves more than anything is to focus on the eating disorder. One thing that, that my parents and I, the turning point for us was when mum and dad started talking to me about me as a human being, as their daughter, as Gemma. And when it comes to reaching out and how to approach this, an eating disorder loves confrontation. It loves being challenged. Whereas if you speak to somebody by saying, look, I know something's not right. I know that things are slightly changing around your food habits and, but also your smile. The heartbreaking thing for me that I remember the most was when dad said, it's like my daughter became a shell of her former self mm. and she was in a prison and there were no bars mm. but I couldn't get her out. Yeah. And, it's, and, that's, and it's heartbreaking and it's tough to hear, but yeah. it's so important that we remember that it's, it's much deeper rooted than just weight loss. Gemma, listen, we so appreciate you speaking to us today. And I know for a lot of parents that will be really important to, to, to be listening to you. I, I feel for the kids that maybe don't have parents who are so tuned in as you did. But thank you so much, Gemma. Um, thank you. Really thank good you. to speak to you this morning. Can I, can I just say one, one thing really quickly? Well, really quick, Gemma, and I'm sorry. <laughs> Really quickly, we didn't touch on, on bulimia and binge eating. I really want people to know that, that there's no stigma or shame attached to that. More and more people are struggling with it at the moment and they must reach out and get help. Speaking is so key. You've got nothing to feel embarrassed or shamed about. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And as I say, I'm very sorry to chase you there. I've got somebody gabbling in my ear. But <laughs> if you are struggling with anything that Gemma has spoken about, please, please head to our website where you can find more information and help available. Uh, we've got lots more to come right after this.